Hi class. Welcome to lecture 1.4 working with financial statements. In the previous lecture we discussed two basic financial statements, the balance sheet and the income statement. We also discussed taxes and cash flow. Now what we're going to do in this lecture is discuss how we would work with these financial statements and some of the concepts that we learned in the last lecture. Now before I get to the key concepts that you should know, let's talk in general first. What we're really looking for are some red flags. You know, one of the things about financial statements is, you know, they're not necessarily looking so much for what might look great sometimes as we are looking for something that looks wrong and and what can we do to correct that measure. Okay? I'd also like to point out that where you go for your information matters. You know, if you're going to an Edgar or SEC or government website, that's one thing. If you're just going to pull something up off the internet, that's bad. Now, the internet has been uh, good in some ways for transparency and for information availability, but it's also been somewhat bad because it's created a lot of false information out there, too. I'd also like to point out that some of the ways that we work with financial statements may be a little bit outdated. One of the reasons for that is that financial statements, at least their structure, is rooted in manufacturing firms. And so like terms like plant property and equipment make a lot more uh, sense to a, you know, a big car manufacturing company than they do to a small company that is mainly service oriented. Today's society though is actually shifting more to some of these service companies so you know you think about uh, medical doctors you think about financial consultants you think of lawyers professors at universities uh, TV shows radio stations uh, in a lot of cases what's the most important asset is not uh, a plant or a property or a piece of equipment it's actually the people involved the people are the asset and so that can be very difficult to put a value on a person and get it right on a balance sheet so I guess my point here is that we'll talk quite a bit about the trees but know that you know there is a forest versus the trees argument here I'm gonna teach you how to compute specific types of ratios but we're doing more than computing ratios. We really need to see if we can develop a way to use this information to make better decisions. So this brings me to the concepts and skills that we want to develop from this lecture. The first one is how to standardize financial statements for comparison purposes. We'll talk about standardizing. How to compute and interpret more financial ratios. There's a great deal of ratios that we'll discuss. Don't get overwhelmed. You don't have to memorize these ratios but it is important that you understand and categorize these ratios in a way that makes sense to you. And then the determinants of a firm's profitability and growth. So, so what's important, basically? And so we really want to understand the problems and pitfalls in the financial statement analysis. And we will get right into that with this very first slide. Okay, this slide talks about what are some of these concepts that uh, specifically going to cover. They're going to cover standardized financial statements, ratio analysis, the DuPont identity, which is a very unique formula that provides a wealth of information, both the internal and sustainable growth rates, and then also some information on using financial statement information. Let's begin with talking about standardization, especially with financial statements. You can get or create both a common size balance sheet and a common size income statement. To do this is really just normalizing the numbers. In the balance sheet case, what you're going to do is take all accounts as a percentage of total assets. And in the income statement, all you're going to do is take all line items as a percentage of sales or revenue. By standardizing these documents, this allows you to compare information from year to year, or it also allows you to compare companies of different sizes, particularly with the same industry. So for example, if you want to, to compare your company over time but you've had some stock splits then your numbers may look funny but in this way you wouldn't have to worry about that as much and also maybe you're Nike and you want to compare your numbers to Under Armour but realize Under Armour is a much smaller company this is a way to make that, those numbers also more useful that gives back to my um, point in a previous lecture that when we're talking about companies and trying to compare performance it really helps to remember that you need to do this either over time or against a competitor or industry average. Okay, now I'd like to switch to um, the pr proof rock balance sheet. 
So let's begin by taking a look at the proof rock balance sheet. Now this is a regular balance sheet, it has not yet been standardized, and as you can see it gives you information for both 2009 and 2010. I'd like you to, play, to pay uh, special attention to the total assets number at 3,373 and the 3,588 numbers. Now we're about to switch to standardized. As you can see in the common size balance sheet that has been standardized, that we now get everything as a percentage of total assets. So total assets will be 100%, and because total liabilities and owners' equities equals total assets, they'll be 100% as well. But this allows us to make uh, more comparisons over time and see what's really going on between the categories. If you're looking at the liabilities and owners' equity change, you can see that there was a big decrease in long-term debt and a big increase in owner's equity. And so tracking this over time allows you to look at this information maybe in a quicker and more meaningful manner. The same thing can also be done with an ordinary income statement. So if you look, pay special attention to that sales number, 2,311, because this is the number we will use to normalize the income statement. Now looking at the standardized or common size income statement, there's some information here. Uh, you know, we can finally see what happens to each dollar of sales. So you start at 100% of sales and you, as you go through you see that 58% uh, is lost to the cost of goods sold. Another almost 12% is taken out for depreciation. You lose around 6% for interest paid. You paid out about 24% in uh, taxable income. Oh, or sorry, I take that back. You paid out about 8% in taxes of the 24% left, of which is your taxable income. And your net income is only 15.7% of your total sales. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad, but that number represents a specific ratio that we'll talk about later known as profit margin, that your net income over sales is your profit margin, which means that you made uh, or got to keep 15.7% of that 100%. Then you decide how you want to spend that money. And in this case, two-thirds of it went back into the company to grow in the form of retained earnings, and one-third was sent to shareholders in the form of dividends. So once again, by using a common size income statement, we can see uh, where all of the cash from our sales went. Yeah, so I think that's pretty neat. So once again, standardization is a very helpful way of creating common size financial statements that allow you to make more meaningful analysis uh, with regards to a specific company. Switching gears, let's take a look at ratio analysis. Now, once again, we're going to really want to look at this information um, amongst competitors or a particular industry average and also across time. Those, are, those two things are going to stay uh, very consistent in, in my lecture format. So that's what we mean here when we're talking about allows for better comparison through time or between companies. Now that's not necessarily what I mean when I say use both internally and externally. What I'm saying there is use both internally by everybody within the company and ratio analysis is also used externally by everybody outside the company like investors that may want to invest in the company. Now, why do we care? Well, ratio analysis is one of the best ways to compare financial performance. So there are two really important questions to ask. What is this ratio trying to measure and why is that information important? Especially to a firm. I'd also you know, say that you could throw in two more questions if you wanted to. What is the unit of measurement? Sometimes it's important to know if we're talking about uh, times, you know, like the number of times a year or days uh, or a percentage. It helps keep the math straight and it really helps you understand the analysis if you know what the units are within a, you know, a specific measurement. And also it helps to know if there is a specific benchmark, you know, what makes a ratio good, what makes it bad, and I think that if you can figure out what makes a ratio good or bad, then I think you're really doing a good job of learning ratio analysis. Not only do you need to understand what the ratios are asking, but it also helps if you can categorize these financial ratios. There are five different categories of financial ratios. There's the liquidity ratio, sometimes called short-term solvency ratios, and this is really asking about 
short-term decisions like can you pay your bills. There's the financial leverage ratios or long-term solvency ratios, and so can you make your long-term debt obligations. There are the uh, asset management or turnover ratios, and this is really asking does the firm use assets as effectively or as efficiently as possible. Profitability ratios are some of the most common and well-known, like the profit margin. And this is asking, is this firm operating efficiently uh, with respect to the bottom line? And then there's also market value ratios. And so this is more taking a market view of the firm. So what is the firm's value from the market standpoint? And so you can see with all of these equations listed on this slide, why it's important to keep these ratios in different categories. Once again, this is mainly for reference. I'm not asking you necessarily to memorize all of these ratios, although some of them you would really want to get to know, especially if you plan to become a finance major. But this is a slide you can go to where all of these formulas are in one, one place, and I think that that would be very helpful. Let's now go and look at each category by itself. We're going to start with the liquidity ratios. Remember, these are also sometimes called short-term solvency ratios. And in this case, low numbers are going to usually mean low liquidity. Let's start with the first ratio, the current ratio, and this is one that I would actually commit to memory. This is current assets divided by current liabilities, similar to the networking capital equation that we talked about earlier, which was current assets minus current liabilities. But in this case, instead of a number above zero, you would really want a number above one because it's a ratio. So you want any number above one means that your current assets cover your current liabilities. Now, how high of a number would you want uh, is you know, and here you see 1.31 times. Is that better or worse than, than you know, 1.5 or, or 15 or 150? Well, it depends on the situation, but usually you want this number to be above 1, but not maybe too high above 1, because that's extra current assets that may be not being used as efficiently as possible. Could be invested in some kind of a long-term uh, project that might generate more value for the company. But let's say that you are a um, car company and that you know one of your suppliers is about to go on strike. So then you might buy a, up a whole lot of inventory just to make sure that you are covered um, in the meantime in case a strike happens. And so that could make sense there. Uh, one of the ways you could then analyze the company is using the quick ratio. The quick ratio takes out inventory. So current assets minus inventory over current liabilities. And this is also sometimes called an asset test because it's looking at those assets, those current assets that are even more liquid than inventory. So you don't have to make a sell to, to, to get to that. So you're talking about, you know, uh, your cash on hand and, you know, you're talking about accounts receivable and anything else that would be considered a current asset. So once again, this is called the asset test because it's kind of like a, a litmus paper test where you can take out inventory and see if that really is the number one reason why you don't appear to have any liquidity or perhaps that it appear to have too much liquidity. In this specific example you'll see that the quick ratio is less than half of the current ratio so well over half of the current assets for this company were wrapped up in inventory. Now that may or may not be a good thing but that is something that you would probably want to compare over time and against competitors. The cash ratio is, you know, looking at your most liquid asset. How much cash do you have on hand and do you have that cash to cover your current liabilities? And in this case, you will see that that number is 0.18 times. And this is sometimes important because sometimes your short-term creditors really want to know about the cash that you have on hand. Not your accounts receivable, not your inventory, but Tell me about the cash. And so these ratios can change, uh, you know, quite a bit. So, for example, Walmart's uh, current ratio could be a lot higher than its quick ratio because it's a, you know, it's a company that carries a whole lot of items. It should have a whole lot of in inventory. Whereas a company like maybe an employment agency, uh, Manpower Incorporated, for example, it might not have any inventory at all. Right, so its current ratio and quick ratios might be exactly the same thing. Moving to the next category, we have the financial leverage ratios. These are also called the long-term solvency ratios. 
and now we're talking about how long can the company go until it needs another round of financing. If you look at the first ratio there, it's called the total debt ratio, and this is sometimes called debt to assets. And I like to say debt to assets sometimes because in my mind that's real easy to remember how to do it. It's debt over asset. Nonetheless, the total debt ratio looks at all debt to all creditors. In this situation, you could say that Proofrock uses 28% of its debt, or I mean 28% of debt, to finance its total assets. And another way of saying that would be then to say that it is financed 72% through equity. So if you take a look at that next ratio, debt to equity, you will see that 28% over 72%. So debt over equity is 0 0.39 times. And if you look at the equity multiplier, that is simply the debt to equity ratio plus 1. Okay, So the equity multiplier is very interesting because the debt to equity ratio plus 1 also equals the same thing as assets over equity. And the important thing to understand here from a mathematical standpoint is that if I give you any one of these ratios, then you should be able to get the other two just using some simple rearranging from an algebra stand, algebraic standpoint. Two other important financial leverage ratios are times interest earned and cash coverage. The first one, times interest earned, is earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest. Specifically, we're asking how well a company has its interest obligations covered. In this case, Proofrock has their interest bill covered 4.9 times. If you look at the cash coverage, it's a, simple, a similar idea, um, but instead of earnings before interest and taxes, you could say it's EBITDA, or earnings before interest and taxes, uh, depreciation and amortization. So what you're going to have here is EBIT plus the depreciation. So it's going to, it adds depreciation because it was taken out of EBIT. Uh, so this is going to give us an accurate look at all cash flows here. So uh, you, you do EBITDA over interest or the EBIT, EBIT plus depreciation over interest. In this case, you can see that that number is jumped up by 2 to 6.9 times. So the cash coverage may be a slightly more realistic number if you're wanting to talk about the actual cash available. Now let's take a look at the asset management or inventory ratios. So what we're really talking about here are asset utilization ratio. Another way of saying this is how well or efficiently do managers use assets to generate sales. Okay, You can see here we have inventory turnover which is nothing more than the cost of goods sold over inventory. The higher the inventory turnover the better the inventory is managed. Um, so, for example, if inventory was turned over 365 times, it would be turned over on a daily basis. Uh, this That would be getting close to the concept of just-in-time delivery. Now, if you look at day sales and inventory, sometimes this is also called the average holding period. We're looking at how many days inventory sits before being sold. So, in this case, you would look at the, num at the numbers almost in the opposite way. The lower the number would be better. In this case, Proofrock lets inventory sit on the shelves for 114 days. Now, why would anybody care? Well, there's a lot of studies that show that the larger this number, the less likely that you are to actually get the cash or get all of the cash back. There's a variety of reasons. Maybe your inventory can become damaged or lost or stolen. Uh, maybe it'll go out of style. So, you know, one of the things that you really care about is really trying to reduce the day sales and inventory or the average holding period. So we could make a lot of comparisons here. We could see what's going on with the inventory for like Target and compare it to Walmart and or maybe uh, Sears Kmart and see you know where they stand from an asset management standpoint. You know or you could compare maybe Chrysler and Ford and Toyota with, with GM. Now, sometimes you have to read more into the story. So just because a company might have a whole lot of inventory sitting on a shelf doesn't necessarily be, be a bad thing. Once again, maybe they're trying to prepare for a strike um, or they've got some other plans down the road. Asset management category also contains receivable ratios, very similar to the inventory ratios. Receivable ratios measure how fast a company can sell its product. So if you look at the receivables turnover, 
you see 12.3 times and once again you'd want this number to be high and in this case 12.3 times means that they collected all outstanding credit accounts and reloaned that money 12.3 times last year now if you flip that around using day sales and receivables or sometimes which is called the average collection period you'll see that they are having an average collection period of around 30 days okay about a month that makes sense for a lot of companies because a lot of companies may give somebody a month to pay now I could have thrown in another slide here on asset management and called it payables ratios and you could have had a payables turnover and then day sales and payables which is sometimes also known as average payables period and it looks mathematically very similar to what we just did here with receivables our last slide for the asset management category is on asset turnover ratios these are two very important ratios the first is total asset turnover which is nothing more than sales over total assets but what this tells us is the sales generated for every dollar in assets now we obviously want this number to be high but low numbers even less than one are not always bad and one of the reasons for that is because a company just could have a lot of fixed assets also depreciation can have a huge impact here uh, depreciation on uh, old assets will increase total asset turnover whereas new assets that have not yet been depreciated will decrease total asset turnover so we also have to be careful with um, you know depre depreciation for some companies versus maybe a company you're comparing it to the capital intensity ratio is really just the reciprocal flip it so you know you're just looking like one over total asset turnover so then you just kind of look at this number in a in a different way but it takes a dollar and fifty six cents in assets to create one dollar in sales I've also seen a what might be called an FAT or FAT, and that's the fixed asset turnover. So that would be sales over net fixed assets. So now you're talking about sales generated for every dollar in fixed assets. However, uh, the, that's not on the slide, and, and you won't be asked that on the, the exam. But it is important to remember because some companies like IBM may not have near the amount of fixed assets like a company like Southwest Airlines. So in that case, Southwest Airlines total asset turnover and fixed asset turnover may be very similar, whereas there could be a big difference between the total asset turnover and fixed asset turnover for a company like IBM. Now moving into the profitability measures, this category is one of the better known categories of ratios. It's also one of the most widely used by financial analysts. Profitly Profitability measures are really just a look at how well a firm uses its assets and manages operations. For example, that first equation profit margin is really just looking at the bottom line or the net income. And as we talked earlier, it's really nothing more than net income divided by sales. And you would see profit margin on a common sized income statement. So in this case, for Proofrock, you'll see that uh, this company generates 15.7 cents for every dollar in sales so you might also hear somebody say this company makes 16 cents on the dollar obviously the higher the profit margin the better uh, because it usually signals low expenses relative to sales and just better overall operational efficiency now you might want to know whether or not a company could lose money because prices are so low but make it up with volume of products sold well no par profit margin can be small but it can't be negative it needs to be positive if it's not positive over time you're gonna have a problem now it can be negative from time to time but you know profit margin needs to be positive over time return on assets is another important equation you will see it used you know later in the class as well and it's really just your net income over your total assets so in this case you have 10 cents in profit for every dollar in assets and then you also have return on equity which is also going to be used quite a bit in this class which is just your net income over equity and this is how well shareholders performed during a year now this is net income over total equity but you will also see this later when we talk about the DuPont identity but more specifically for this slide you can see that you have 14 percent I mean 14 cents in profit for every dollar in equity
Now, although we won't get into too many of the details here, it is important to point out that ROE and ROA will use book value for equity and assets. So uh, those that information must, you know, be considered with the understanding that we are using some book value information, not just market value information. Also, the major difference between return on equity and return on assets is the idea of whether or not we're using financial leverage. So if the ROE is greater than the ROA, this is you know indicative of the use of financial leverage. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the DuPont identity as well. Okay, our last category is market value measures. And a lot of this information won't necessarily show up in financial statements, uh, but these are, you know, if, assuming the company's publicly traded, you can usually get a lot of this information off of the internet. One of the main pieces of information that you care about is the market price, right? What is the stock price for a company? So in this case, you see $88 per share. Now, if you know the share is outstanding, so in this case that's $33 million, then you can multiply $33 million times $88 and find out the total equity in this company. And you'll find out that this company is worth close to or a little bit over $2.9 billion. Using this information, we can also get earnings per share. If you take earnings or net income and you divide it by the 33 million shares outstanding, you will get $11. So $11 per share is your earnings per share. Now, if you will take the price per share, which is $88 per share, and the earnings per share, which is $11, then you can get something known as the PE ratio. 88 divided by 11 is 8. So in this case, this company has a PE ratio of eight times. This is a multiple that is used very often in comparing companies against other companies and to decide whether or not you would want to invest in a firm. So specifically in this case, Proofrock shares sell for eight times their earnings or carry a multiple of eight. What does a high PE mean? Well, a high PE, PE for example, uh, would be a, a PE ratio usually, you know, somewhere in above 20 and uh, maybe even above 12 but it's usually an indicator of one of two things if you're a growth investor maybe it has significant growth prospects you like if you're a value investor maybe it could also mean the company has zero earnings and that you're not interested in it or that it's highly overvalued on the flip side a low PE a PE usually less than 12 uh, maybe in this case 8 or you know even lower would be indicative of a company that could be undervalued if you're a value answer a value investor or also maybe a company that doesn't have a whole lot of growth potential if you're a growth investor so uh, different types of investors will analyze the PE ratio differently one way to adjust for this is to use a peg ratio which isn't listed on the slide but it's basically taking um, you know the price divided by equity divided by growth so it's going to use a growth percentage there to decide whether or not the PE ratio is justified on growth so uh, by the growth rate so this will let you know sometimes whether or not it's a company that is a, it's a growth company with a high PE ratio or if it's a value company with a high PE ratio so a lot of uh, GARP investors growth at a reasonable price investors like to use ratios like PEG to see you know whether or not they are getting a, a good company based on the growth rate the other two ratios here, price to sales and sometimes called price to book or market to book ratios, can really help you to understand whether or not a company is overvalued. Price to sales is especially important for startups because a startup company or a new company may not have a lot of earnings or maybe even negative earnings. So uh, using just a pure PE ratio, you would never want to invest in these companies. However, they may have some really impressive long-term potential and so maybe you want to look more at the sales they're generating not necessarily the earnings because they've got a lot of upfront you know high upfront cost now if you think about price to book or what's called market to book ratios what you're really here doing now is just comparing uh, market value to book value okay so finance numbers to accounting numbers and there's a lot of information you can get from a you know market to book ratio or price to book ratio um, for example, if this company is less than one, then maybe this firm has not really created value for its shareholders. You know, sometimes that there 
you could also maybe buy the company and sell it for its assets and make money. So, you know, like Bain Capital, which is one of the things Mitt Romney was involved with, or maybe like Richard Gere for Pretty Woman, what his company did. Uh, you know, maybe they buy up companies and break them apart and sell them because they're worth more broken apart than they are together. So, you know, almost like, you know, the opposite idea of synergy. Now another thing you could take a look at that's not listed up here is Tobin's Q. Uh, you may hear this down the road, and what this really looks at is market value over replacement cost. So it gets away from the fact that you don't that book value may be outdated. Now, Tobin's Q is probably a better number. That being said, why don't people use Tobin's Q over um, you know price to book or market to book ratios? The reason is simple. Okay, replacement cost is kind of hard information to get, right? So uh, you have to acquire that information. You may have to, you know, pay for an appraisal, and uh, it can take a lot of time to get it too. So you've got cost and time constraints. So a lot of times people will just fall back to the price to book ratios or market to book ratios. Okay, so this is a proof rock ratios recap. So you know, I gave you a slide that had all the ratios. Now, uh, with the formulas, now here are all of the ratios with the numbers that we've calculated during this lecture. So once again, this is here for your reference. So moving beyond just the basic ratios and their basic equations, let's look at an example. Here, let's compare two companies, Lowe's and Home Depot. Now, if you look at homes, uh, Lowe's and Home Depot, you know, they're pretty good comparisons. They do pretty much the same thing, but I want you to, you know, pay special attention to this ROE number down here which says that you know 17.45 percent of return on equity for Lowe's and 24.81 percent return on equity for Home Depot now if you're an investor that difference would really you know make you want to question what is Home Depot doing to get a higher return on equity well to answer that question I'd like to introduce you to a really interesting formula called the DuPont identity. Now if you remember the ROE equation from earlier, net income over total equity, that's your basic formula. However, ROE also can be broken down into three different categories. Profit margin, net income over sales, uh, total asset turnover, which is sales over total assets, and equity multiplier, which is total assets over to total equity. So if you look at the equation there, you will see that you could uh, cross out sales because you're multiplying and dividing by it, and also cross out total assets because you're multiplying and dividing by it, and that would just leave you with net income over equity or the basic formula. So in some ways, the DuPont identity is nothing but more but extending out the basic formula into these three different categories. Now, what that means is, is that you can look at uh, a number like when you're comparing Home Depot's and Lowe's ROEs and say, why are they going up? You can look at their profit margin, their total asset turnover, and their equity multiplier and see if any of those particular ratios tells a story. So if we go back and look at this slide again comparing Lowe's and Home Depot you will see that the three categories total asset turnover profit margin and where is equity multiplier I know it's not listed here oh but we do remember that debt to equity is almost the same thing remember that equity multiplier is simply one plus debt to equity so we could just add ones and we've got the equity multiplier here so those three numbers right above ROE are the numbers that we're going to be paying attention to and let's take a look at that let's see uh, if you look at profit margin Lowe's actually has a slightly higher profit margin so that can't be the reason for the higher return on equity if you look at total asset turnover you will see that okay uh, Home Depot is doing a slightly better job of managing its its assets there and if you look at debt to equity ratio you'll see 0 0.92 versus 1.5 so the bulk of the difference in the return on equity is coming from this debt to equity ratio or the equity multiplier which simply means that Home Depot is using financial leverage to generate a higher return on equity which could be a good thing or a bad thing uh, and a cheat sheet or a way to look to see that those numbers should have actually been much closer is if you look at return on assets return on assets remember is 
very similar to return on equity except it doesn't consider financial leverage and if you look the return on assets between Lowe's and Home Depot are, are very similar Home Depot's is slightly higher still but uh, not as big of a difference as you see with return on equity so let's go back to what we understand about DuPont identity when using the DuPont identity there's a you know three things that we want to look at profit margin total asset turnover and equity multiplier remember that profit margin is going to explain the operating efficiency of a firm total asset turnover is going to explain the asset utilization rate for a firm and equity multiplier is going to talk about financial leverage or how a firm uses debt once again you've got cost control or operate operating efficiency with profit margin you've got use of assets with total asset turnover and you've got financial leverage with the equity multiplier you will need to remember these for some of the math problems that you will have on the exam and also just for how to quickly break down two companies and understand why there may or may not be differences in return on equity for example let's look at the DuPont identity for proof rock we can get the ROE using the DuPont identity by multiplying profit margin which is 15.7 percent total asset turnover which is 0.64 and equity multiplier which is 1.39 we multiply these numbers together and we get 14 percent for return on equity now all of these numbers look okay you know from a basic standpoint however it would be much more helpful using this information if I was comparing proof rock to another company or comparing proof rock over time nonetheless I would really encourage you to put the DuPont identity in your toolbox this is going to be a very useful tool for analysis within this class and most likely later in your careers as well now I'd like to move on to the internal and sustainable growth rates uh, this is the last concept for this lecture remember that when you get net income or earnings that you can either use that net income to help fuel growth within the company through retained earnings or that you can kick those uh, earnings back out to your shareholders in the form of dividends well the percentage of dividends over earnings okay so dividends over net income is called your dividend payout ratio also known as 1 minus B okay and your retention ratio is going to be that value given to retained earnings over your net income or over your earnings okay and it's gonna be just B and the reason for that is you can you know obviously 1 minus B plus B equals 1 or you add these two together up and you're gonna get 1 or 100 percent and that makes sense because it's 100 percent of net income goes to one of the two categories now once you've defined the dividend payout ratio and the retention ratio which sometimes um, is a little bit confusing you can then move on to understand the internal and sustainable growth rate so just to clarify exactly where this information would come from for the dividend payout ratio which is 1 minus B with proof rock you can see that you would take 120 of your dividends which is right off that income statement over 363 which is your net income and that's 33.3 percent so before I even move on to the next slide I know what my retention ratio is it's going to be two-thirds right or 66.7 percent and as you can see with this slide I am right now the one thing I will want to point out as well is that sometimes the retention ratio is also called the plowback ratio because these are retained earnings that are plowed back into the firm to allow for growth so if you notice plowback ratio that means the exact same thing as retention ratio now that we know for sure the difference between the retention ratio and the dividend payout ratio let's look specifically at the internal growth rate now the internal growth rate is how much the firm can grow assets using retained earnings as the only source of finance what that means is internally or how fast can we grow the company using only our own sources of income and money in this case the internal growth rate will be ROA, ROA times B remember that B is the retention ratio over 
1 minus ROA times B. So if you'll figure out the ROA times B in the numerator, then you can plug that same number down in the denominator as well. And in this case, you get 7.23%, or this company can grow a little over 7% on its own. Looking at the sustainable growth rate, the only real difference between it and the internal growth rate is that instead of using ROA, we're going to be using ROE. And remember, conceptually, the difference there is that ROE contains financial leverage. So in this case, we're actually going to look at how fast can we grow using external financing too. Not by itself, but in addition to our own retained earnings. And so what we're trying to figure out here is, you know, maybe some debt is optimal. You know, there is an interest tax shield with, uh, to consider with debt. And you know, leverage can allow us also to take advantage of some opportunities. So uh, it is important to see how fast we could grow. And in this case, you could, uh, this company could grow 10.29%, which is about 3% faster than it could grow if it only used its own funds. So this brings me to the determinants of growth slide. Now, as you can see here, there are uh, a few factors that determine the growth for a company. The first three listed here are all going to increase the growth of a company. And they are all the three different aspects of the DuPont identity, right? Profit margin, total asset turnover, and financial leverage. As each one of these goes up, the growth rate for a company would go up, just like you know ROE would have to increase. The dividend policy, however, uh, which is how much to pay the shareholders versus reinvesting the firm, if that uh, goes up, then the growth would go down. So and vice versa. If, it, if the dividend policy, if the dividend payout ratio goes down, then growth goes up because what you want is a, a higher plowback ratio or retention ratio where more money is put into the company. So instead of saying dividend policy there, if I just said, you know, uh, retention ratio, then all four of those would have increased with the growth rate for a company. And this is a very important slide. I could see a, a really good exam question coming from this slide. Once again, the internet can really be your friend here. You can find a variety of information on financial ratios from sites like Yahoo to, um, Finance or Morningstar and you know just a wealth of other websites as well. If you would like, you can click on www.businessweek.com slash finance. Here you could choose a company with uh, using a ticker symbol. You can get some financial results, key ratios, and you can even change the ratio category using the links to the left of the chart. And now that I've talked about your internet resources, I'd also like to you know, just give you a quick quiz to let you know some of the information you should have gotten from this lecture. So hopefully you can answer these questions. How do you standardize balance sheets and income statements? Why would that be useful? What are the major categories of ratios and how do you compute specific ratios within each category? What are the major determinants of a firm's growth potential? And how do you make meaningful comparisons? And I'd like to use that question uh, as the last question to just have one more chance to tell you that once again, ratios by themselves may not be useful, but, it, but if you can compare them over time or you can compare them against a major competitor or an industry average, you can really gain a lot of insight into the performance and quality of a particular firm. This concludes Lecture 1.4, Working with Financial Statements. Thank you.